Hello and welcome to the cellar door. I am in Mansfield. It is a very chilly winter morning, but I am on my way to warm up at Delatite Winery with some of their delicious wines and a tour of their brand new cellar door. Let's go. I'm David Ritchie and I've been here at the Delatite Winery for three generations. The vineyards were first planted in 1968 by Robert and Vivian Ritchie, my parents. My husband Robert decided to grow grapes without telling me. I came to the cattle grid and what did I see? But 500 sticks lying outside the fence line. Oh, he said, I forgot to tell you, we're going to have a vineyard. The winery was built in 1982, but I was doing a lot of cattle work and sheep work uh, and also helping out in the winery, helping my sister, Roz, who was the first winemaker. And then Roz left the winery and I basically took over as sole general manager and managing director and basically I've been a jack of all trades. I've, I've worked selling wine in Melbourne and selling wine to our you know, distributors and also selling wine to individual retailers and restaurateurs. Also quite, quite big, but nothing like as broad as you know, Alsatian Grease. I'm doing more in the winery and vineyard and export. And I'm also, I suppose at the moment anyway, I'm, I'm getting the landscape right round the build and getting our orchard and vegetable garden going. Before I head inside for a tasting, David's giving me a look around their brand new cellar door. This is the entrance walk up from the car park mm -hmm. and it's being planted with uh, baby snowmen, so, so eucalyptus porciflora. Baby which, snowmen? Yeah, they're called baby snowmen, which is sort of, <laughs> they're sort of dwarf snow gums. Oh, beautiful. And then, you know, in time we'll actually also have a, a lot more native plantings underneath. And then as we walk up, you come to the outer courtyard and inner courtyard. Although not quite complete, there's still a water feature and a creek to go in. This courtyard creates a beautiful entryway to the stunning panorama on the other side. Okay, I'm excited to get through here and yeah. see this kind of expanse. Yeah, this is, this is the, big, the big reveal when you walk through that door. And yeah, there's Mount Buller and, and the vines. And, um, what a greeting for your Yeah, customers. I think so. Yeah. It's our eastern view. And so you're looking over one of our dams across to what we call the Buller Blocks. Mm -hmm. And you're in what we call Vivian's Courtyard. Vivian was my mother. Yes. So the matriarch. Yes. An impressive and, lady. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> very. She and Dad actually started the vineyard and then the winery. Mansfield has very high altitude, 15, 1600 feet. No soil. As you can see, all the rocks that are coming out for the new building. And that's why Delatite has such unusually special grapes. Time to taste the fruits of these special grapes. Let's kick things off with the Riesling. Riesling Gewurz Tramina are probably what, we're, what we were first known for and what grew really well in this lovely cool climate. Yeah, so is this, this is the German style of Riesling? Yeah, it's very dry. It's uh, got lovely acid, lovely fruit. Here in Mansfield, we've built a great reputation for Rieslings which are both very nice early on in their life and also developed tremendously well over time. So this is the 2019. Mm -hmm. He did very well with James Halliday with his rate, rating system so that's always a good thing. We've only just released it in the last 
I suppose, a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So it's had extended time on, on in, in bottle and just showing really well. Mm. One of the things we do very differently here these days is, and I suppose for the last uh, 12 years since Andy Browning, our winemaker, came on board, is we, we don't crush our white grapes, except with the Hell's Window, which we'll look at next. They're, they're just whole bunch pressed, so hand-picked, mm. whole bunch pressed, so very gentle. And it means we don't get many solids and we don't have to add much to, to, to our wine. This gentle approach is at the core of Delatite's philosophy. We're looking to be able to put the health back into the soil. Conventional farming uses lots of chemicals, lots of uh, synthetic fertilisers, and these things basically strip the soil of all of its microbes. And without the microbes in the soil, you've got dead soil. Everything's hand-picked. That way the fruit get, comes in in the most pristine and the uh, most undamaged state possible before that gets uh, pressed or crushed to make wine. Because we hand-pick everything, because we don't use chemicals, because we don't use enzymes, we don't use any of these protein-finding agents uh, because our juice and our wines are in much more pristine condition. So you just don't need to add anything to it. What a lovely acid this is, your lovely flavour. These grapes are going to be top loaded into our press and um, no crushing, just pressed, just like I'm doing now. It's going to be great Riesling. My favourite variety, without a doubt, is Riesling. I love the variety. It does so many interesting things from when it's very young, where it's zesty and uh, lemony and limey and floral, all the way through to when it's aged and it's got those beautiful honey, buttery, toasted characters. It's, it's a fantastic variety. They're fermented naturally, so they're all wild yeast fermented, and a portion of them go into large format oak. So, you know, 500, 800 litre barrels, which are not, it's not for the oak flavour, it's just for yeah. the complexity and for the lees contact and... Yeah, there's no, I can't, there's no oak at all. It's no, no. really clean. Yeah, but what, what you do get is, is you get a lot more texture and, and, mid, and I suppose weight on the middle palate, yeah. which without being too, you know, technical about stuff. Because <laughs> um, the, more, the more you talk about wine like that, the, the less you probably enjoy it. Uh, but we think it's a very European way of making wine and you know, using, using chemistry, using modern equipment, but going down to the old ways of making wine, searching for doing things naturally to bring better flavour, better quality and using And less. a more environmentally aware approach as well. Yeah, that's right. We don't add milk products, fish products, egg products to any of our wines yeah, and our so reds are unfiltered. So. so your whole range is vegan? Yep, our whole range. I'm not a vegan, uh, but uh, I eat plenty of meat. <laughs> but it's lovely that um, we, we don't have to add anything because yeah. I think that's, to a certain extent, unnatural. Yeah, yeah. this is delicious. Yeah, thanks, George. It's... Thank you. <laughs> I'm at Delatite, at the foot of Victoria's high country, and I'm lucky enough to be one of the first visitors to their new cellar door. Like it's quite a, not Spartan, but a clean kind of yep. build. What this will have in time, will have, uh, it'll be a covered deck, mm -hmm. and it'll mirror the inside roof with battens, and it'll have, uh, and where people are sitting, it'll have heaters plus fans mm -hmm. uh, for summer uh, and winter. <laughs> and, uh, depending, and we'll be growing vines up along some of these, uh, what do you call them, well, the uprights? Pillars. Pillars, and so it will, it will have a trellis running all the way along mm -hmm. to provide a bit of shade and protection. Oh, wow. So yeah. It just keeps going. If you're sitting in the dining room or sitting on the deck or sitting here, you've got views to the north, to, towards Tolmy and, and over Tolmy is the King Valley and you've got farming land and, the, and rolling hills. Mm. And then to the east, 
you've got again farmland and the mountains which are covered in clouds at the moment, it's probably snowing. And then and all the way down to the south, which again is farming land. So it's and you've got so vines open. within it. It's yeah. Incredible. It's clear this land is special to the Ritchies, and sustaining its integrity is central to their vineyard practices. In keeping with his philosophy of minimal intervention, David has been running the vineyard according to biodynamic principles since he took over in the mid-2000s. I believe, you know, we're custodians of the land and we need to leave it in a much better place and a much better state than when we started working it. Commercial winemaking, to me, is very much a matter of just like, well, I'll throw more chemical at the problem and that will fix the problem for me. And I suddenly realised that a lot of these sprays, they just weren't working and they were killing they were killing a lot of beneficial insects in the vineyard and they were killing a lot of beneficial fungi actually in the vine canopy. Dead soil leads to poor quality wheat, fruit, whatever, whatever it is that you're growing. You need to have richness in your soil to really get fantastic fruit for your wines. You can also see the fact that we don't use any herbicide here. Anyone who thinks um, we use, we use it, all you have to do is come into our vineyard and you can see all the grass. The vines are now sitting in a rich, biodiverse environment rather than sitting in scorched earth and maybe one grass species in the mid-row, nothing underneath them. I have to admit, at first I was extremely sceptical of biodynamics because uh, it was always presented as being this very, well, to be blunt, airy-fairy type idea. But as I look more into it, there's a fair bit of good science to back it up. It's just a balanced ecosystem. And if you take any one thing out of it, you get into some serious problems. So here is our biodynamic flow form stirrer. And basically we're trying to create vortexes here to put energy into the water. So what we have in here is we have um, a bit of horn clay, uh, BD500, uh, we've got a bit of manure concentrate and also we've got some kelp amino acid from Grow Green, which is a fully organic fertiliser which we often spray on vines, so we're just putting this in there as well. The water's pumped from a submersible pump into the top and it just runs down and creates a, you know, a vortex, it creates a circle one way, circle the other. We put it out at a reasonably low rate per hectare. I think it's about 50 litres, 40, 50 litres a hectare and it really acts, you know, it's got a lot of biological stimulant activity. Back in the cellar door, it's time to taste one of their newer creations. So this is the first of our sort of native wildlife featured range and it also extends into a Mansfield White, a Mansfield Red and our Tempraneo. And it's sort of our, our natural range where, yeah, it's really about Mansfield, it's about this vineyard, it's, the, the wines aren't varietal. We, we feature insects and animals, birds, whatever, which, which are, in, are in the vineyard. And the Hell's Window, this is the first. The priority is to make the best wine we can uh, from a few different varieties. It's very European again, that's what they do, you know, in Rioja, it's what they do in, in um, Bordeaux, it's what, you know, they're not worried about the varieties. What they're worried about is, is, is how all the different grape varieties and wines meld together to make the best possible wine. The blend that we put together will be Gewurz, Pinot Gris and Riesling. So the reason we choose those three varieties is that the Gewurz gives you beautiful flavour, gives you that lovely musky characteristics. Pinot Gris also gives you fantastic sort of ripe pear type flavours. And the Riesling, more than anything, is chosen for its acidity. This acidity gives the wine structure. As for the colour... Colour comes because we, we make it like a red wine. So, so it's, you leave it's, it on the skin. Leave it on skins and it's crushed and then plunge down by hand every day, two or three times a day. And so you get colour coming from those skins, those purple and pink skins. And then after a while, it's all transferred into big old oak to finish its fermentation. Um, it's got that beautiful Gewurz nose. Yeah, it still does have that yeah, Yummy. lovely Gewurz. Mm. And yeah, as I said, nothing's done to this, nothing's added to it at any point. It's, it's filtered prior to bottling and that's it. So natural wine is a wine that really for a winemaker is dead easy to make because you take the grapes, you put them into a fermenter and you go, I'm done, I'm finished. So with a natural wine, you're not trying to do anything to the wine. You're trying to let the fruit express itself. 
no filtration. So these wines are always going to be hazy, but they show much more what the location will do for those grapes. And this, it often surprises people, this, this sort of wine, because a lot of people are expecting it to be very much like a Riesling or a Gewurz or our, or our white blend. Whereas to me, it's a drink. And natural wines are really drinks. They're more like a Campari or a, yeah. or a cocktail than, than a, um, you know, a really varietal, you know, clean wine. Yeah. Um, and it's great, it's great in summer. A bit fizzy, ice block, you know, it's just a great drink. Mm. And it's the fastest growing category in the world, these sort of wines and mainly taken up by people from their you know, mid-twenties to mid-forties. And delicious. Beautiful, mm. glad you like it. Mm. Just make sure. <laughs> you um, talk a lot about this sort of German influence and style. Is that somewhere you spent a lot of time? Yeah, I spent a lot of time and we had quite a few German winemakers through the eighties and, and I've still got very good mates who are German winemakers. Alsace, and which is just across the, the river from the Kaiser Stuhl, that area is is quite close to me, and the sort of wines I like making. And in actual fact, when you look at Pinot Gris and Rieslings from that area of Germany, uh, they are very much like what we make here, and they get a lot more sun in that part of Germany than than on the Rhine, and so much closer to what Australia makes. But these days, due to climate change we're having to adapt and yeah. move away from, I suppose, northern, northern European varieties. And we're moving to, I love Rioja and I love Spain, I love Portugal and I love their wines. So we're even planting Verdeo this year, which is a, a mm. classic white from Spain. And we've already have Garnacha, which is known as Grenache. We have Tempranillo, Graciano, Torriga Nacional from Portugal. So we're really looking at moving to any time we're planting new varieties or extra vineyard, we're putting in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. The changing climate is something David is all too familiar with. It presents an ongoing challenge for vineyards across Australia, especially those in cool climates. And as always, adaptability is the key. Grape growing, especially for wine, is a canary in the agricultural coal mine. Because grapes ripen over such a long period of time, it very small differences in temperature have a major effect. Now back in the 70s when my, when my parents were first getting grapes from the vineyard and then in the 80s, we were picking from early to mid-March and finishing in late May. Come forward 40 years and we are picking early to mid-February to late April. I find it extraordinary that climate change has been so immediate. I mean, 50 years ago, the grapes were up there. Now they're way down there and still planting. We have to try and grow our grapes slightly differently. So we prune a lot later to, to enable the bud burst to be a bit later because we're getting more frosts in spring, early spring. And it also pushes the ripening period back by a few days. So that's helping a bit. It's not just in the vineyard that Delatite is responding to climate change. David is holding all the wineries' operations accountable. We're trying to do everything we can to make things more sustainable. We've had solar systems on our, on our roofs here. We're going to be putting in a new solar system out in one of the fields and a battery, which should hopefully just about cover all of our energy needs here in the winery, which would be fantastic. We use a lot less cooling than we used to, which, you know, the huge amount of energy in the wine industry goes through through cooling juices, cooling wines. You know, we tend to be a lot more natural. We, we use natural yeast in, in the winery. We don't do nearly as much clarification. We don't use nearly as much filtration. We don't use nearly as much refrigeration as we used to. They're also in the process of converting all their vehicles to solar power. This is made in Bendigo and it retains its charge for a long time. We can basically run this all day and it only goes through about half its batteries. It costs a little more than, than the petrol or diesel version, but we did our calculations on fuel use. We'll pay for it, it'll pay for itself within 14 months. It's a no-brainer going electric here. We have one planet, and if we bugger it up, we, if we denude all our resources, 
there's no longer a planet for all of us, let alone all the, all the plants and animals which, which we're living alongside. And we just have to become more sustainable in what we eat, how we live, and how we, how we make things. Absolutely scrumptious rosé. There is so much on offer here, but I must confess, red wines are my biggest weakness. Uh, well, one of them. So I'm keen to finish up my time at Delatite with a few of David's favourites. First, the Mansfield Red Blend. This is the first one we've made of our field blends, of the reds, and it's basically a blend of whatever we think will go best in it. Mm -hmm. So this is a blend of uh, Shiraz, uh, Malbec, Grenache and Graciano and in time we'd like it to be all made from Spanish varieties but at the moment it's also uh, maybe some Shiraz mm. but at the moment it has you know a range of what you, what you would say are French varieties as well. Mm -hmm. Championing this place being the Mansfield area and what we what we do with uh, viticulture with biodynamics and, and, and all of that and making a really lovely red wine. So the percentage changes? Percentage will change every year and the varietal composition will change every year. And at, at the cellar door, this uh, has taken over as our, as our best selling red. And, um, it smells amazing. Yeah, well it's, well, it's just very complex. It's, mm. it's quite soft, very easy to drink. Yum. Got lovely soft oh, yeah. tannin. Mm. Yeah. What's it? What's the Graciano flavour? It gives it great structure. Mm. It gives it good tannin and great colour. And Jancis Robinson always, you know, what she says about Rioja is that when when it's a great year for Graciano, it's a great year for Rioja. Mm -hmm. And even though it's a small proportion of it, often you know, five to fifteen percent, it can make all the difference to to Tempranillo. And I think we're finding that here now uh, as well, that, that Graciano for us is a very important part of, of w whatever blend we're doing. Mm. Oh. Last up, the Reserve Shiraz, which I have no reservations about. So this is the way we plunge all our estate and reserve reds, probably about half our high grounds. The old fashioned way. You get much better skin colour extraction than modern rays with pumps and rotor fermenters. But fortunately, we're small enough that we can continue to do this. Let's try the Roberts Block Reserve named after David's father. So all our family reserve blocks are, are available from the dispensers and for both tasting and by the glass. It's quite a treat for people to be able to access your museum stocks. Yeah, by the glass. yeah. well for us it just made sense because otherwise we can't show people our, our museum wines or our reserve stock. Now they're available, they only last yeah. <laughs> a few days. So yeah. we'll only ever have six um, reserve block wines and they're made from discrete parcels of the vineyard, parts of the vineyard. We only make up to 150 dozen of this wine. It's often only 100 dozen. I think one year we only made 50 dozen. So it's, it's very limited. And with our reserve block wines, it's a maximum of two, 250 dozen a year that we can make from those, from those plots. And really it's the pinnacle of, of what we can do here with Shiraz. It normally gets around 100% new oak. Andy might decide to give it um, to give it cold maturation, you know, be before ferment. So just keep it cold and mm -hmm. cold soaking it, or it might get extended uh, maturation on skins post ferment. It'll then, you know, after it's after fermentation, it'll, it'll it'll and it'll go into new oak and then spend 
probably 18 months, mm -hmm. uh, up to 18 months in oak, but always just trying to look for the right balance. Yeah. But probably an extra six or eight months compared to our normal estate wines. So are those different approaches depending on the vintage in order to try and maintain that, that uh, signature flavour? Yeah, yeah, for it? exactly, George. Can you see that, that changing as the climate here sort of heats up? Yeah, definitely. I mean, mm. back in the 80s, we were making wines which, looking back on them, were, were pretty green. We were denied at the time. <laughs> you know, our red wines, we'd be picking them late April through to late May. These days we're picking, um, generally, the latest picking is around Easter, so early April to late April. Mm. So it's come forward a full four to five weeks. So, cheers. Cheers to you, thank you for having me. Thanks, George. I've been to a lot of cellar doors and wineries over the years and enjoyed them all, but Delatite has made a lasting impression on me. David's commitment to the preservation and enrichment of the land here is truly inspiring, and the rewards of his approach are evident in everything from the spectacular cellar door and surrounding gardens through to the delicious wines I really can't get enough of. Just like a fine wine, all the elements have blended perfectly to create a real showstopper. Well, that's it from me at Delatite, and that is it for another episode of The Cellar Door. I'll see you next time.